everyone. Welcome to our session on enabling AI, machine learning, deep learning uh, via containers and open on demand. My name is uh, Robert Sutledge and joining me will be Srijith uh, Rajmohan and um, you know, we'll be presenting this topic. Uh, before I start, you know, I'd like to thank the HPC Knowledge Meeting Committee for inviting us to uh, talk on this topic. Our goals are uh, really simple today. Um, because we can, we can talk a little bit about ourselves. After that, I really want to um, discuss what I think are barriers to use of HPC, um, particularly for uh, new uh, users. I'm going to introduce uh, Open On Demand as a tool to help um, reduce those barriers. Uh, I'll discuss a little bit the features that are included in Open On Demand. We're going to create an app that I call BYOC. That's Bring Your Own Container um, on HPC for us at Virginia Tech. That means a singularity container. Uh, and then I'm going to turn this over to my colleague uh, Srijith to talk about some of the AI, machine learning, deep learning um, uh, container um, containers that he's been using uh, in his own research uh, as an example. Okay, so first a little bit about uh, us. Um, again, my name is Bob Sutledge. I am in a group called Advanced Research Computing, one of many across the country. Uh, I am in Virginia Tech. Um, at Virginia Tech, we operate within Central IT. Our goal is really to help users at Virginia Tech uh, use uh, HPC, um, particularly if they need it in their research, but also to um, help in the education mission of the university as well, so particularly uh, in how to use uh, HPC in research. Uh, what, what our group does is really kind of act as a, um, a, a centralized resource across the, the campus. Um, we work to um, spec out new hardware with users in mind, so we we'll, we'll, um, involve our users in sort of figuring out what we need what, where the gaps are, that type of stuff. Um, and then, you know, the, the last bullet is really that we can we can do some research as well. So that, that's that's kind of a fun thing. Um, uh, at Virginia Tech, um, we have a lot of hardware. Uh, we have somewhere around a thousand nodes um, split across several different clusters, uh, including many different architectures. Um, majority of which uh, is currently Intel based, uh, although we're in the process of installing a pretty large AMD uh, cluster. Uh, everything is uh, fa fairly heterogeneous, so we have nodes that have different specialty hardwares on them, including GPUs. We have some nodes that have really high memory, um, more uh, geared towards big data, so lots of local disk or you know, stuff like that. We also have a pretty nice uh, visualization uh, resource. Um, you know, once you have data, you might want to look at it. Um, it. You know, so we 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 try to help researchers do sort of everything um, in the in the life cycle of a research project involving data. So, um, data acquisition, compute, uh, visualization, publication if you need it, you know, that type of stuff. Okay, so barriers. Um, really, here at Virginia Tech, uh, availability of hardware is not, at least right now, uh, a, an immediate issue. Um, even though our queues are pretty busy, we have a lot of hardware. Um, where I see barriers is, is really in um, new or maybe non-traditional users uh, accessing and using our system. So, you know, if you think about it, um, generally, for HPC, we're asking our, our users to use something like SSH to uh, gain access to the clusters. Um, they have to use unfamiliar tools like VI or you know, one of those um, text editors, command line text editors. To get data in and out, we're, we're asking for FTP, SCP, you know, rsync, something like that. All these things are kind of non, non-standard in non- um, hardcore CS engineering type disciplines. 
So in my opinion, um, this is creating a barrier to use. So we're, we're asking our non-CS people to be computer scientists. So not only do they have to learn biology or medicine or whatever, but also, by the way, you should, you should become a computer scientist. What that translates into uh, for, for me is a ticket. You know, so when I think about this problem, I think about tickets and, you know, okay, I'm answering tickets about SSH access instead of um, doing something more interesting like uh, working with the user on um, data cleaning or you know, um, some sort of data analysis pipeline. So this is where Open On Demand comes in. So Open On Demand is really a, uh, a web-based tool to access um, HPC resources. So basically what we're doing is providing a more familiar web-based front end to HPC. What that means is our users have to be less of a computer scientist and maybe more of um, a domain scientist. So we're going to take away or abstract away um, some of the pain points that um, our users are, are currently experiencing. Some of the features of Open On Demand are listed here. And, you know, basically it is a web experience, so that's more familiar. Internal to Open On Demand, there's a file manager. There's a way to get to the command line uh, easier via the, the browser. Uh, there's some job management tools that I'll show you. And um, you know, there's, there's uh, a way to enable and then expose uh, graphical um, user interfaces, so GUI type applications. So again, out of the box, um, you know, some of the things that you get is a landing page. I'm, I'm showing the Ohio Supercomputing Center landing page. There's a files app, which I'll show in a couple of minutes, a job composer app, and a job monitor, and then a, a way to extend this to other um, other other GUI type applications. Um, importantly, uh, users authenticate through the browser. So at our institution, all of our students and researchers and PIs um, are, are, are used to logging into Virginia Tech uh, resources into Canvas, for instance, for education uh, through the browser. And Open On Demand is basically harnessing that uh, tool for us. Um, so uh, if the user can authenticate uh, to Canvas, they should be able to authenticate uh, to our HPC clusters in the same way. Um, once you've installed Open On Demand, the first thing you want to do is, is start extending it. So you know, our, our users don't just want to manage their files. They want to run some more interesting applications like uh, maybe Jupyter or MATLAB, RStudio, Paraview Console, a whole host of other things. And so an important part of Open On Demand is that we can um, add what we call um, uh, apps that extend the core functionality of uh, Open On Demand beyond um, that developed uh, at OSC. A couple of examples are shown here, uh, and I, I've already mentioned um, them, but you know, Jupyter MATLAB, R, uh, Studio that is, Stata, TensorFlow, um, a whole host of them. If, if you can imagine it, we can wrap a, an app around it and then uh, make it available to your users. Uh, it, we're seeing a lot of adoption in Open On Demand. Um, this figure is uh, a little bit old, but um, you, know, you can see that we, we have uh, people that are downloading uh, Open On Demand across the world. Um, so I think it's showing itself as a generally useful tool. Uh, recently, uh, we were awarded a um, an extension or for Open On Demand 2, or not an extension, but another award from NSF uh, to, to, to develop further Open On Demand. Uh, there's four focus areas. I'm really not going to um, talk about each one of those, but you know, if, if, you're, if you're interested, uh, you can go to um, the website, uh, and you know, I've shown it here, but it's basically a discourse site. Um, okay. 
So where I want to go uh, today is through uh, a quick demo of Open On Demand, and then um, I want to create an app. And so that, that's sort of the culmination of what I'm going to talk about today. Okay, so what I'd like to do next is just a kind of a walkthrough of Open On Demand and the features that um, are available. So I will switch over to a uh, different tab. Uh, so this, this is on demand as it's installed and configured on our systems. We actually have three different instances of on demand uh, going. So we have a, uh, a dev instance. So that's kind of where we just test a new version of, of on demand. So when OSC um, comes up or, you know, um, releases a new version, that's where we install it and just make sure uh, it's working for us. There's a pre-production that we'll go to in a couple of minutes. That's where um, we test out uh, new apps. So I can um, develop a new app, uh, deploy it to that, ask a user to um, test it and see that it's working for them or you know get suggestions for changes or whatever. Uh, beyond that, we have our um, production instance. That's the one that we're looking at here. So after we've tested one of the new apps, we'll push it over to this instance and we'll, uh, we'll see that in a couple of minutes. But, um, you know, this is the one that we hope that most people are, are using. Um, we have a, we have the, we have a full ability to customize, uh, the landing page. That's this one. Uh, in the slide, you saw the OSC version. You know, here's the Virginia Tech version. In this version, I have um, I've decided that you know putting some uh, metrics on the use current uh, sorry current status and use of our systems is important as a way to guide our users in submitting jobs. So a lot of our users might want you know kind of a quick job, for instance, and they could. You know, quickly look at this and say, well, okay, um, there's not a lot of no, uh, full nodes available on Cascades, and actually for that matter, Dragon's Tooth, uh, but maybe maybe Huckleberry would be a good place to, to, to get a full job quickly. Um, so I've got some graphs, I've got uh, tables, um, you know, and so forth. So, you know, this is fully customizable. In our instance, I decided that some um, use metrics are, is kind of an appropriate thing. In the standard install of Open On Demand, you really have uh, a couple of different things that are that are um, kind of the core apps, if you will. There's a files app. There's some job management functionality. Um, clusters is really the shell-based access, and then interactive apps. So I'll just go through these, and then. Where we're going to end is the interactive apps, and then um, what we're going to do is develop a new app um, for uh, deploying on the pre-production system that will basically be a uh, bring-your-own-container app. So it's one that I've, I've been wanting to create for a while, and you know this, this is a good opportunity to do that. Two birds with one stone. Anyhow. Okay, so... Files. Uh, users obviously need to interact with the file system at some point. Um, newer beginning users or maybe users in, in that, that would prefer sort of a, a tree-based um, file management um, system can come here for this. So I have exposed uh, directories uh, that users have access to. So for instance, their home directory across our clusters. Um, some, the scratch file system, and then um, persistent storage for, uh, for groups. Every um, HPC center is going to be a little bit different. This is how we have it, um, have it set up. And all I've done is, is really uh, um, enabled Open On Demand uh, to, to see and expose these various uh, um, file systems to, to the users. So, for instance, my home directory. Um, if I click on that uh, on that link, I'm opening up uh, a, a tree view of what's in my home. So you can see, you know, I've got a bunch of little temp files and other things in the main 
uh, directory and a bunch of directories over here. Um, pretty importantly, um, users can drag and drop from local to remote and, and back. So oftentimes one of the first um, things that uh, a user will ask us is, okay, you know, I have access to the systems, how do I get my data there? Or um, I did some simulation, how do I get my data back? Okay, so they can use this to um, up and download files pretty easily. Not only is, uh, are, are people able to you know, manage files, um, but they can also edit files, which is, is, is pretty nice. Okay, so I just saw, you know, here's this bench 25R. I, if I wanted to, I could, I could view it or I can, I can edit it and get basically a, a, you know, a, a, a more familiar tool to, to edit a text file. So, you know, I'm not stuck in VI, for instance. Okay, if, if I had edited something, the save thing would be here. I can maybe change some of the options, that type of stuff. It's not it's not the most fully featured editor, but it's a it, it's it's um, it's a bit more familiar than VI. Okay, um, file management, um, job management. So the job um, management tools that we have are really um, sort of centered around. Uh, looking at the jobs that are in the schedulers or creating a new job. So we'll start here. So one of the more unfamiliar things on HPC clusters versus where most users come from, which is their local uh, machine, is that to get something done, by and large, we have to submit a job, which is a shell script, uh, to one of the schedulers and that scheduler looks for resources that match you know, the request and then that gets run. So that, that's a that's a pretty big um, you know uh, conceptual leap for someone who's used to you know pressing the run button and it gets uh, the, the code gets executed uh, immediately and the results um, are sort of available right there. So you know, all we're really doing here is exposing the schedulers to open on demand and allowing on demand to display what's uh, what's going on. Um, I have all jobs, so let's just look at my jobs. And I know I don't have any there. Let's do this. Okay, so you can see here I've got uh, I've I've actually I, the those plots are actually run on our clusters or the, the plots on the dashboard are actually created on our clusters through some jobs that I have run every 10 minutes and they're scheduled on Dragon So you can see here, here's my, here's my jobs that, that effectively just create those plots. Um, okay. So, um, let's go down here to job composer. So when, um, when the OSC team was first creating uh, Open On Demand, one of the realizations that the PI Dave uh, Hudak came to was that, by and large, um, jobs are clones and or slight edits of jobs that uh, that that people have um, run previously. So, in other words, you've you've done a simulation, and now you want to change a parameter. Well, okay, so what you're probably going to do is uh, take a previous job script, um, copy it, and make a slight edit, and resubmit it. So that's what this job composer is kind of all about. Basically, I've got jobs here that I can um, um, edit and resubmit. Um, and in a more familiar tool than, you know, VI or whatever. So, for instance, I can create a new job, I can use a template, I can you know, use it from you know, some sort of path or whatever, and then um, basically I, I have these jobs here, I can submit, stop, you know, whatever. Um, I can edit as well. So, um, you know, for instance, there's this, uh, this template that's on Huckleberry. Uh, if I want to edit, edit it, I can use our editor. Maybe I do something, you know, uh, mind blowing like look at uh, look at the modules that are available um, yeah, great job right uh, 
Um, but you know, here's my new script um, to, to get it to run. All I do is submit it. It goes to Huckleberry, and you know, there we saw on the, the other uh, page that it was a pretty instant. Uh, it, Huckleberry was not very busy, um, so that job started right away. Okay, so cool. Um, really not where we want to go to today. Where I'd like to go to is interactive apps. So um, I'm going to come here. Uh, basically, um, what we what we have available are a bunch of different apps that are more like domain apps on the various clusters. Okay, so these are uh, work in progress, if you will, but these are the applications that we have um, uh, enabled through Open On Demand uh, for for our um, for our users. Uh, so um, you know, here's I mean, you can read the ones that are available, but basically what this is is a web form that then submits a job to the schedulers, gets run, and then exposes uh, exposes um, the, the, the GUI. So we'll just do this real quick. Um, basically, I'm, I've created our Studio server um, containers that uh, expose, or that, that in, in singularity, that um, you know, basically run our Studio server and, and expo um, allow users to use that on our clusters. Um, right. So, you know, basically what we're going to see when we build our own container is we have, um, we have the full, uh, we have full control over what, what, um, what we, what we put here and what settings we allow users to change on these apps. And in fact, we can make this pretty custom. So I'm just going to hit launch and we'll see what's, what's going on. Okay, so basically what happened is uh, that web form turned um, into a job script, and that job script is currently sitting in, uh, in the, the queue. Um, I'm going to open that and then come back, come back here. I want to see it in our active jobs. Okay, so here's that job um, sitting, in, uh, sitting on the cluster. It's in the queue that I requested. Its current its current status is queued, and it's on the cluster cascades. Okay, close that. Okay, it's actually starting up. I know that because it tells us that. So it moved from uh, queued to it should actually say running when we look at it in the in the in the scheduler, but it's sort of starting up here. What's happening is um, some code that we'll see in a second is kind of running, and um, this app is looking for the port that our studio is listening on to be active. I'll show you that uh, kind of over here. So what I'm looking at, so this is clicking on that blue link. What I'm looking at is everything that goes into that job. So the job is here. So this script was submitted to uh, Slurm as an sbatch job. And I can edit it, or actually view it. This is what's happening behind the scenes. So um, basically I'm you know, setting up a proxy so people can load their own software. I'm loading our singularity module because our studio uh, in, in this particular app is run in a container. I do some crazy stuff with uh, with the container to make sure I've got um, paths right for the R environment, and then eventually down here, I'm calling Singularity um, and the container, and then our studio, and it sits here on uh, you know listening for um, uh, on on this port. Okay, and we'll we'll walk through that in a minute when we create our own app. We come back here. Our studio is now running. If I click on that, up should pop our studio, and um, you know, importantly down here somewhere it tells us, yeah, this is our studio 4.0, and I've got a bunch of packages that are um, installed in this particular container. Okay, so there's 
not a lot of mystery to this. Basically, this is uh, open on demand, creating a job script that's submitted to the Slurm uh, scheduler, Slurm in, in our case, uh, that gets run as a job and open on demand knows what to do when that job is run. Okay, in this part of the talk, I would like to go through how to create your own app. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to show you how and then show you what it turns into. And um, I'm not going to do a lot of typing because I'll probably, I'll probably have a lot of typos. But anyhow, so I'll show you what to do and I'll show you first uh, kind of the help to get you get you kind of oriented on, on where to go for more uh, detailed instructions. So first off, um, I'm on the open on demand uh, help site and I'd have to say that the tutorials and um, documents here are really nice. There's a really um, a really nice walkthrough of a couple of the standard apps including Jupyter R Studio and MATLAB. What I want to show you how to do is just you know create a, a, a form that allows a user to input their own container as a start for uh, uh, an app. Um, if you want to see a list of uh, apps that others have have uh, in, installed, um, well, there's a nice list here. We're going to actually start with uh, this QGIS app as our um, scaffold to build uh, a new app. So basically all we're going to do is we're going to clone this uh, to the local system and then start editing that as our scaffold. So let's get busy. Okay, so this is the basics of what comes in an app. There's a form that is really uh, Ruby or HTML code to create the form that users interact with. Um, the manifest is really how it shows up in the open on demand inter interactive apps dashboard. Um, the submit is uh, basically how this turns into, say, a, a Slurm sbatch job. And the inside template is the actual script that gets run via sbatch in our case because it's slow. If we just look real quick at uh, what's in the form um, currently, so th this is the OSC version of this form. You can see that they're specifying a cluster, they're specifying a, a number of widgets that show up, uh, etc. Um, and we will edit this to be uh, more specific to Virginia Tech. So if I go back real quick to um, to the open on demand, you know, first note that I'm on the pre-production site, which is where my um, where we share our um, our apps, so that we can, you know, if I develop it, I can then send it over to someone else to to test. At the top here is a list of apps that are system wide. And then down at the bottom, there's these sandbox um, widgets. This is where my widget will show up, or my new app will show up. Okay, so again, you know, I, I, I've kind of already done this, and I'm just going to show you the output uh, to this. Um, and so I've customized this form now to be um, something that will work on our clusters. So first off, I've... I've made this available for our Cascades cluster. I've added a new um, widget that will allow people to um, enter in a text box, a container that they want to load. Um, and I've, I've, I've specified that as uh, something that's going to show up on the form up here. And in fact, this is the order of the different widgets that will show up on the form. And so I've, I've put the container kind of down towards the bottom. I've changed some of the things that are more specific to our clusters. So for instance, 
Well, here's the queue list down here. Um, over here, you can see that this particular um, app on the OSC site would show up as uh, QGIS in the GUIs category, and there was some help about the Owens cluster and so forth. I've um, changed that to be. Oops. I've changed that to be. You know, I've changed the name. It's going to show up in the Cascades uh, category. There's some help about singularity that will show up, and then um, some, a link to the Cascades cluster. And if we look at how the form looks now, again, I've changed the name. It's going to show up as BYOC. Um, you know, there's the links to help. Um, I've added this field, or I've changed the field to, to say Slurm account. There's, when we say, um, if we just say account, we get tickets because users are like, is that where my PID uh, goes? No, that's really the Slurm account or allocation that we'd like you to use. Number of hours, number of cores, those are explanatory. There's a pull down. It's not really a pull down. There's a um, there's a box now for um, which queue I want this to go to, and now there's a text box for um, people to enter in their container. Um, I, I'll, I'll show the code here in a second. Um, but when I hit launch, this basically submits this job to the queue, and it'll sit here waiting for a second. So while we're waiting for that, I want to look at the code again. Okay, so I'm going to go inside... Let's um, okay. So in this directory, there's a template folder. I'm going to go inside that template folder, um, and then uh, again inside that, there's this um, this script. This is the script that actually gets run with the S patch. So I want to look at that. Okay, so inside the the, the script, um, the script.sh, I've changed it now to load the singularity module on our system. Um, I'm actually running this uh, through a virtual desktop. Um, sometimes that's an easier way to get started with some of these uh, GUIs is, is just loaded on a desktop. But the most important thing is right at the end, Singularity run, and then I have it uh, use the container um, that users uh, specify. I can do a lot more than, than I've done here, so I can put some um, validation code in the form. Uh, I, I, can, I can add uh, text, box, text boxes to allow users to bind specific directories, etc. So, you know, there's, there's a lot more that we can do with this. This is really just the basics. Let's go back to um, Open On Demand. Uh, and so now you can see it's running. I can now um, connect to the app. And indeed, my QGIS is, is up and going through this virtual desktop. I don't have to go through the virtual desktop, but as a, uh, as a, as a, Usually, when I'm developing um, new GUIs, I, I usually um, I develop it on my laptop. I push it up to Docker Hub. I pull it down on our clusters via Singularity, and oftentimes the first place I'll test it is on a virtual desktop on our um, clusters. And so it's a it's a little easier way to go uh, first, um, uh, at least for me. That's been my experience, and. Um, Certainly, it, it, it gets the it gets the, the GUI up and, and, and going. So this might be a, an easier way for users to, to do this. Um, so, you know, what have we done? Um, basically, we had to, or I had to edit a form uh, that specified the fields I wanted users to see. I indeed edited uh, the submit. Um, it's not a, a submit. Uh, YAML.herb is what it should say, um, so that uh, the S batch received the fields that I wanted it to receive from the form. Um, I 
didn't edit this, nothing was necessary, but in this particular before script, um, all we're really doing is making sure that the module system is available. Uh, the, the real special sauce is in this uh, script.sh. This is the batch script that's submitted through sbatch on our Slurm systems. And what we did in here was really uh, loaded um, uh, the, the Singularity module and then launched uh, the, the specific container that, that users um, asked for. So um, not a lot to do in this particular case, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, we, we, we received our, um, our, our GUI started, so good news. My name is Dr. Sridhar Wajman, and today I wanted to talk about reproducible deep learning, uh, specifically using Conda environments and uh, Dockerized GPU containers for deep learning. So the case study that we use for this uh, is one of weekly supervised natural language processing or natural language understanding. So the infrastructure consists of two parts, the one that was used for data ingestion and the one that was used for training for deep learning. Um, I'd like to give a brief overview of the workflow and how we used Airflow to perform the orchestration with all these components using Conda environments. And finally, I'd like to talk about how Ansible was used for deploying uh, one, the visual analytics app that was created um, using Conda environments and how we created a portable uh, Dockerized GPU training environment. So here we use uh, natural language understanding for determining political affiliation. Uh, in general, uh, the goal of understanding intent is quite a difficult one to begin with. So for this purpose, we create a human in the loop application. Uh, I'd like to call this augmented intelligence because the human is actually being aided by the results of the deep neural network in uh, making decisions, or in this case, classifying documents. Um, and finally, it's also interpretable. So one of the, the issues with uh, neural networks is that it's usually accused of being a black box. So self-attention here gives insight into the decision-making process of a deep neural network. We start by gathering the social media posts related to certain political hashtags along with the user metadata. Uh, we then use PySpark to lightly clean the data. Um, we then proceed to project the affiliation that is learned in a two-dimensional space similar to a form of aspect-based sentiment analysis. So this is kind of similar to sentiment analysis in general, but it's uh, targeted and more granular. Uh, as far as the architecture is concerned, we use a self-attention-based bidirectional LSTM with pre-trained static and contextual embeddings. Uh, specifically, we used ELMA in this case. We also wanted to evaluate the visualization or cognitive efficiencies of various dimensionality reduction techniques. Uh, in our work, we looked at PCA, uh, multidimensional scaling, at TSNE, and ISOMAP. And finally, uh, we built an interactive web-based application to help label this weekly supervised data. So I say weekly supervised because the, the labels that are assigned to these uh, the documents aren't exactly correct. So there's some noise in, in those labels. So the goal is to effectively learn information from data that, that may not be accurately labeled. For data ingestion, we used Virginia Tech's uh, cloud server instances, uh, which had about 18 cores, 192 gigs of RAM, and about 700 gigs in volume. Uh, as already mentioned, I used content environments for package management. For data downloading, I use Python RQ, which is a lightweight Redis-based framework for job scheduling. Uh, for interaction with Twitter, the Python API TweetPy was used, and we downloaded and stored tweets corresponding to certain hashtags in timestamp files. And MongoDB was set up as a database for interacting with this data, and Metabase was used as a front-end dashboard for interacting with this as well. So the training is done on a GPU node with four Volta GPUs with 16 uh, gigabytes of per GPU memory. Uh, the PyTorch code that does the model training uh, generates the accuracy, F1, and RSC scores, and also the data needed for dimensionality reduction. Uh, the Plotly code then takes this data and actually generates the, the graphs uh, using the information. And last but not least, uh, hyperparameter optimization was done using comment.ml. 
So this is an overview of the general workflow of this uh, problem. We have two sections here. The one in light purple refers to the pre-processing section, and the one in light blue is what the user actually interacts with. So uh, on the left-hand side, you get the data through RQ, uh, through TweetPy, which then gets ingested by MongoDB. Uh, this is then lightly uh, processed or cleaned by PySpark or uh, Spacey, uh, which then becomes our pre-processed training data, which is fed to the deep neural network. So the deep neural network uh, trains the, uh, the, the trains on the data, uh, produces results, which are then fed to the interactive visualization application, and the user can sort of iterate through the loop to form a sort of active learning. So we have a more detailed view of what's happening on the right-hand side of that block diagram earlier. Uh, so the neural network reads this weekly supervised data, and then it produces these F1 scores, RSC metrics, and so on, and along with the visualization data files. Plotly then reads this data and actually generates these visualizations. Uh, this is then fed to the interactive human in the loop framework, and that loop essentially continues. Uh, however, if you look at the top here, you can see that uh, you also have a hyperparameter optimization loop where the code actually calls the Comet API to find the optimal combination of hyperparameters for the problem we're trying to solve. So once we have that combination, we can just continue with the loop uh, as, as always. So this is essentially what our web-based interactive framework looks like. Uh, you can divide the, the space into four quadrants, essentially. Uh, the top left corner uh, consists of the visualizations. Uh, we have TSNI and PCA loaded here. Each uh, glyph here represents a document and a corpus, and they're colored according to the ideology. When you hover on each one of these glyphs, uh, the information corresponding to that uh, document shows up on the right-hand side here. Uh, you can also see, I think uh, the screen unfortunately cut off, uh, but there's a heat map corresponding to each document that represents the weight that the neural network assigns to each of those words. Essentially, it's telling you how it's making the decision for each uh, uh, each document. Now, on the right-hand side, you also have the predicted label and also the weekly supervised um, ground truth label. There are a couple ways to ensure reproducibility here. Uh, my preferred way is to use environment.yaml files for Conda. However, one key thing to note here is that you want a minimal uh, YAML file. Uh, so you want a minimal set of dependencies instead of taking everything that Jaconda export gives you. Uh, that can be a little difficult to reproduce sometimes. Uh, if that is not feasible, however, uh, you can use Docker containers through Docker files. And for both of these options, I, I like to use Ansible to make sure that the environment is set up uh, appropriately and the folder structure for training is correctly laid out. So you can uh, use the environment.yaml file that was exported from your environment and create a new one. Uh, so here we're looking at, at an env.yaml file. However, you can go in and add or remove packages as needed manually. Creating a Docker file, however, is a little bit more involved. Uh, because we want to use the GPUs inside a Docker container, it's preferable to start from an NVIDIA uh, CUDA base image and once you've done that, you can uh, reuse a lot of the instructions you use for creating a Conda environment. Once you have your Docker file set up, you can go in and build that image using Docker build, and you can list all images available to you using Docker images. So when you're running a Dockerized application, you can use the uh, GPUs flag to indicate that you want to use the GPUs on your host machine. So this can be followed by either a number or the all flag to suggest that you want to use all the GPUs uh, on your machine. Uh, you also probably want to map the uh, host folder with all the code inside your uh, GPU container because you'll probably be making changes to it as you're executing it. And you can use a hyphen W to set the working folder inside this map container. And if you're not going to reuse the container, or if you don't want the hassle of going up and going back and cleaning up uh, every time, you can use the arm flag to ensure that the container on exit is removed. So putting it all together, there's an example of actually executing uh, our code uh, using Docker, and this is running on the GPUs. So 
you can always use NVIDIA SMI to make sure that it is in fact executing on your GPUs as expected. Uh, finally, I'd like to wrap up by saying that there were a few things we've not been able to address so far, uh, such as performance in dark containers. Um, I hope to do that at a later talk. Uh, you can always uh, reach me by email here. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions right now. Uh, thank you for attending the talk today.